It's been six years, six years ago this weekend, when Margaret, the kids and I traveled up here from Texas to visit to explore a possible call to do ministry with you. And one of the things that I noticed about St. John's Saginaw, it, it drew me to you then and it still draws me to you today, is this resili- resiliency that you have about you. When challenges come up, you meet them. And, and I love that about you. And I've, I've noticed that specifically over the last four weeks because we've had some brutal Bible passages to work our way through. I mean, even this past Wednesday for the morning devotion, Jesus was talking about a master and which slaves deserve a light beating and which ones deserve a more harsh beating. I'm like, how long, oh Lord, are you going to talk about this stuff? Can you just please stop and give us a break? Because we've got so much going on. Life is throwing a lot at us as a nation, as a world, in, in our individual and communal lives. I mean, here we are again once, once more. It is fall, and the church is faced with a budget deficit like we were last year and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that, and oh, we're still here, which means we'll deal with it next year and the year after that. You, you get me? You get me? Are you following me? So you're resilient. We're going to keep going. And so today I want to focus on something a little more light, uh, because quite frankly, I need it, and hopefully um, you'll agree. And there's a, there's a phrase that we heard chanted in the psalm. Everybody okay back there? Good. Uh, we are chanted in the psalm, and we'll hear it again in the offertory anthem, I believe. And it's Psalm 84, verse 3, which says, Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. And even in the hymn that we just sung, there's this notion of abiding with God. And so I want to keep with that theme. And I I know several of you have Jewish friends who would have recently, as of last Sunday, they finished with their Feast of Sukkot. It looks like in our Bibles, Sukkoth, but it's actually Sukkot. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, B-O-O-T-H-S. And what that's about is that when God liberated the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, they went into the desert, this temporary space. They had to work through their selves, their mentality out of slavery, and then having God as their sovereign as opposed to Pharaoh. And on that journey, they stayed in temporary shelters called tabernacles. And so they're, they're built out of the materials, natural materials. And if you would, look at um, page 12. I've had this in the sermon notes. Um, I actually have this a little bit out of order, but that's, that's okay. You'll follow me. We'll get there. So Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, this is a rubric on how God's people are to celebrate tabernacles. And what it says is this, on the first day, you shall take the fruit of majestic trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Now, the rabbis I listen to, here's how they describe that. And it does make sense for us. It applies to us because Jesus was Jewish and Christianity, in our estimation, is the logical extension of what we read in the Hebrew scriptures. Not in a supersessionist or arrogant kind of way, but this is what we believe. This is how we interpret it. And so what's happening here with this instruction is that God's people are to take the fruit from a tree and then they're to take a branch, a leaf from the tree, a leaf first, then branch, 
And then the root system, you see, the, it talks about the willow that goes down to the brook. And of course the brook, water, and then the water nourishes the tree and there comes the fruit, right? So what it's talking about is this notion of connectivity, of abiding, of dwelling with. Fruit, leaf, branch, root system all the way down to the water. Following, follow me so far? Now that's in contrast to what we read about in Genesis chapter 3 where Adam and Eve, and she's not even called Eve there yet, she's simply the woman. Go figure. But what do they do? They take the fruit and they disconnect it from the tree and unlike what we see in Leviticus, where there's seven days worth of rejoicing with Adam and Eve because they took the fruit and disconnected it from the source, there was not joy. So there's a benefit to looking at the world around us and understanding that the fruit is connected to the source, and we can rejoice in that. But when we try to eat of fruit without understanding where it came from, then we get ourselves into a little bit of trouble. And so what I want to do is apply that to how we think about receiving Holy Communion, right? With the Christ event, and we've already heard this in our hymns a little bit too, where God condescends, God comes down to us on our level to raise us up to God's level. That's what the incarnation is all about, the physical, tangible presence among God, God dwelling with us because God loves us. In the sacraments that Jesus gives us, God dwells in those through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Episcopalianism, Anglicanism is not so much one to worry about how that happens. We can get into all sorts of theologies and whatnot. We don't worry about that. We simply take Jesus at his word on this and don't worry necessarily about the particulars. But we trust that God comes to us in the sacrament. And so when we receive the bread and the wine, maybe it's helpful to think about that reception in the same way that the Israelites in the wilderness would take the fruit and the leaf and the branch and the root system. To hold it all up and to remember our connection. And we do that I'm going to walk. Don't get scared, choir. Please don't. Now, this is one of the things we do with when we pray benediction. We don't do it that often, but we do it. So imagine that you have the bread inside the monstrance. This is called a monstrance. And you'll recognize that word because monstrance comes from the word demonstrate. So it means to show. So we're showing the blessed bread. And then when we hold it up, we, the priest would bless the congregation as such. And with the bread, if we think about it, it was shaped into a circle. It's thin, but it was wheat and came from the ground and had root systems which went to water. Are you following me on that? And then we have that same sort of action during the Eucharistic prayer when the priest holds up the bread, this is my body do this in remembrance of me and then the same thing with the wine, drink this in remembrance of me and so this all goes to connectivity there's a benefit to being connected, there's a benefit to receiving communion now on page 11 of your sermon notes, you'll see what these benefits are. And my contention is that in the same way with our Jewish brothers and sisters and their feast of Sukkot, 
They refer to the fruit, the leaf, the branch, and the root system as the four species. Maybe we can see what the important species are when it comes to what our catechism calls the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. So that second part there from the top under under sermon notes says, what are the benefits we receive in the Lord's Supper? And the response is, this is what the church teaches about the Eucharist, is the benefits we receive are the forgiveness of our sins, the strengthening of our union with Christ and one another, there's that connectivity, and the foretaste of the heavenly banquet, which is our nourishment of an eternal life. And so, as we receive communion today, for those who will be praying spiritual communion from home, and as you pray spiritual communion from home Monday through Saturday in our daily devotions, I invite you to approach the sacrament in the same way that we might approach the four species of Sukkot. To think about how receiving Christ into our lives, we have forgiveness of sins, we have a strengthening of connection with God and one another, and this gathering, this entire enterprise that the church is all about is to give everybody a picture of what eternal life with God will be. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm.